Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to the friends of Horaces joining us from different hubs of the world at this time. When we meet in Horaces and build our friendships, they last forever. They are so humane, they are so genuine, they are so intellectual, and we get to build these friendships that uh, is based on mutual respect. And for us to be together on a virtual now is going to be a very exciting time because of the expertise of the panelists uh, will contribute, that our intellectuality will continue, but our hugs hopefully come together soon when we have a physical event, because those are the moments that we meet and we miss each other, and I can't wait for the next one to come soon. Um, our challenge today, or our world transforming world's challenge today, is a subject that Dr. Frank Richter has chosen for this panel, which I thank very much for us all he, he, to bring all of us together. So the topic that we're going to cover with the expert panelists will be the governments and their institutions stumbled over their reaction to the COVID pandemic. Trust was rapidly lost. How can these institutions rebuild our trust? Is the nature of institutional trust different across Asia than across the Western world? How long will trust rebuilding take, even as COVID becomes better managed? This, uh, this, this is an amazing subject that is uh, in a, in a very, very uh, geopolitically challenging world and economically and environmentally challenging world. So therefore, uh, I would love to get each panelist's view. I'm Metin Gouverneur. I'm the chairman of the founding, founding chairman of the Salon. The Salon is focusing on creating and adding value together with purpose through innovative and collaborative mindset. And I'm very touched to be able to host you as your moderator today. We will not, uh, we will, we, we still have two other panelists that will be joining us, but we will start now and we will start with uh, Manfred Zuch, Vice President of Concordia University of Edmonton, Canada. Manfred, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay, everyone? Well, yeah. we hear you very well. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good evening, fellow panelists, guests attending this session. I'm Dr. Manfred krebsky zoik I am a Vice President of External Affairs and International Relations at Concordia University of Edmonton, a capital of Alberta in Canada. Um, Concordia Edmonton, short, I will just say Concordia going forward, is not related to Concordia University in Montreal, okay? Montreal, we exist since 1921. We are celebrating 100 years now. Uh, I come from an immigrant family uh, for many generations. My European ancestors have immigrated from Brazil, from Germany, from Italy, from, from, uh, from Germany, Italy, and Russia to Brazil. And I was born in Guatemala and raised in Brazil as a Brazilian. I have lived abroad during my life and immigrated several times to Germany for two and a half years, France for 11 years, now in Canada for 15 years. I've been at Concordia for 10 years now and uh, overseeing all the university's outreaching units. And uh, I see my vocation as a, as a bridge builder. I've been working in higher education in Brazil and Canada for many years, teaching and administrating. Being an um, immigrant and build bridger, I have been sensitive of cultures, languages, diversity, the otherness. And one thing is key in this universe that I wanna highlight today is communication. So for the subject today, two quick facts here, or a couple of quick facts here. Our province government has decided last year in June, based on a percentage of vaccinated population and betting on herd immunity, to announce that come July 1st, all restrictions in Alberta for COVID would be lifted. 100%. All of them. So July 1st, everything would be wide open as before COVID. We were promised that this would be, I quote, the best summer ever. Then the Calgary stampede could happen, the big rodeo in the neighboring city of Calgary and all the rest of it. University professors and administrators 
They were concerned, though. And I read an article of uh, Manish Raizada in the Globe and the Mail um, about, I quote here the, the, the article, um, Canada's universities and colleges have broken their students' trust. This was written in mid-August 2021. In Alberta, it was in the middle of the best summer ever. Yes, COVID was still here and got out of hand in this province. It ended up reaching the worst levels in the province and of Canada. Mid-September, the government comes back with communication reinstating restrictions and uh, a restriction exemption program. My university, which was op operating face-to-face -face since early September, closes down campus the very next day again. And we go online for again for two weeks while implementing the vaccine proof program and shortly the, uh, after the vaccine policy. So campus reopens to, for face to face with many restrictions, including proof of vaccination two weeks later on October 4th. October 25th was the deadline for second shot vaccines proof and the end of rapid testings. And if any of the professors, staff and students chose to continue being part of the Concordia family, they needed to be vaccinated or have an exemption based on medical or other um, grounds protected outlined in the Alberta Human Rights Act. This whole situation is very dramatic and stressful. And again, for my university, clear communication has been and is key in the trust factor. Uh, once summer was open for business here, cases began to rise and rise again. But as we see from the, from the media and social media, what I'm saying is, is just open uh, information here. Um, the sudden silence of the government leadership when everything opened, including the health authorities, uh, for a long time, they had been giving regular updates and sometimes even daily uh, updates on COVID here uh, before that. This silence, combined with the situation getting out of hand in September, led to an outcry from all sides, including the ranks of, of, of the party, of the government, and so forth. And, and then trust eroded, as we can read in the media. So truthful communication is a key element. Not the only one, but a very important one. I want to leave it at that now for just the beginning of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, we evolve in life saying that you trust, but trust is not enough. It needs to be trust and no doubt. That needs to be communicated in the journey. We'll progress now to hear uh, Jayesh Ranjan, Principal Secretary of Government of Telangana of India. Uh, Jayesh. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Metin. My greetings to fellow panelists. Greetings to all the attendees. So I'll bring uh, Indian experiences into this debate and uh, try to address the same theme of how governments have uh, failed the people, lost trust, lost credibility. But then what has been done to restore that? And uh, I'll bring both the national example as well as a provincial example. So as uh, Metin introduced me. I work for the provincial government of uh, the state of Telangana in uh, the city of Hyderabad. India, as I'm sure all of you know, is a federal country. So while there are while there is a national government, there are national laws, etc. But in the federal setup, the states also enjoy lots of autonomy. So I'm a member of the government. I look after uh, the portfolios of information technology, industries, CSR, skilling, and so on. And I played uh, different roles uh, during the uh, pandemic period, which uh, started in India from uh, March of uh, last year. So I'll give a couple of anecdotes, some incidents to explain what really happened and to highlight how this whole issue of trust that has been lost is now trying to be regained. So uh, last year, when the pandemic struck India in uh, March, really, the national government led by our uh, prime minister, Mr. Modi, decided to impose a complete lockdown, a total lockdown. The 
reality is that uh, the prime minister appeared on national television at uh, 6 pm in the evening and he announced that a total lockdown is getting started from 9 pm so literally he gave 3 hours of uh, uh, notice to people to get their act in uh, place and then uh, be prepared for a long lockdown initially he mentioned that it will be just for 2 weeks and uh, uh, of course uh, not much of concrete evidence was flowing around at that point in time to make some very definitive judgments but he led everyone to believe that this is a, a short term kind of a sacrifice which everyone has to make but thereafter this prolonged uh, for uh, more weeks months and eventually it went on for more than 6 uh, to 7 months now what happened was that uh, as all of us understand india is a very heterogeneous country while there are uh, some of the richest people of the planet who live here but we are also home to some of the poorest persons and if you look at the indian cities the economy of the indian cities typically is driven by migrant workforce who come from the villages in fact if you look at any of the service chain of economy in the city for example people who are street vendors people who are uh, your uh, bus drivers your cab drivers people who are domestic workers people who work in the factories most of the bottom of the pyramid kind of jobs uh, in the in the economy is uh, typically performed by people who have come from other places now obviously they are not uh, natives to this place their support system their security net is limited and if you declare a sudden lockdown imagine the kind of impact it will have on their livelihoods and so thousands and thousands and thousands of people all over the cities big cities in particular i myself live in a big city called hyderabad which is the fifth largest in the country uh we started witnessing the tremendous uh, challenges the tremendous vulnerabilities to their uh, livelihoods which the migrant workers uh, started facing and uh, when the two week period passed by they were somehow able to sustain and survive with whatever little savings they had for the first two weeks but when it became clear that this uh, lockdown is going to be prolonged indefinitely something very very tragic uh, started unfolding before our eyes the entire public uh, transport system was closed there were no trains there were no buses and what we witnessed was uh, something uh, kind of uh, unforgettable and also unforgivable we witnessed millions of migrant workers who literally started walking back to their homes and it is not that it is just uh, some few miles away hundreds of miles away thousands of miles away some of their walking journeys went on for 20 days 25 days and the tragedy is many people lost their lives and it was such a pathetic sight to see people walking small children holding a baby on their head whatever little belongings they had carrying it in their hands and uh, without food without water and of course lots of it also spurred in lots of uh, goodwill lots of charity amongst the commonest people some of the most humble and common people decided to pool their savings pool their efforts they stood on the path which uh, these migrant workers were taking gave them food shelter footwear and uh, so on and so forth but the fact is that uh, the country let down such people the marginalized people the most uh, vulnerable people now what is the flip side so that is the tragedy we lost trust and it is not that we lost trust only of those people everyone was aghast even the intelligentsia the well of people were also dismayed at the kind of treatment being meted out to fellow human beings so that was the tragedy that is uh, an episode of losing trust losing credibility but what was uh, done subsequently so the government realized that migrant workers they may be voiceless they may be literally at the bottom of the pyramid but they also deserve to be counted so government has now started working on a slew of welfare measures for the migrant workers new policies have been introduced and uh, there is now a national registration going on of the migrant workers and obviously the migrant workers do not live in their native places so lots of policies have been introduced to ensure that uh, regardless of where you are living you will be entitled to lots of benefits etc so this tra- tragedy in turn has led to some very proactive some very positive action and it is hoped that the outcome of this tragedy will be very very positive and through these measures the government will be able to restart uh, a very proper uh, level of dialogue and engagement with this segment i'll take please another minute please, please please no can i take another minute or sure, of course, please 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 okay sure so i'll i'll give an uh, reverse example uh, this time from the provincial government 
where I work in the state of Telangana. So Hyderabad is a very important uh, industrial city, uh, industrial destination. Lots of manufacturing is located here. Hyderabad, incidentally, is the pharmaceutical hub of the country. 30% of India's uh, pharmaceutical uh, products are manufactured here. We contribute to 40% of the exports. 30% of the world's vaccines are manufactured in Hyderabad. We manufacture close to 6 billion vaccines every year. That is uh, roughly a third of the entire world's uh, vaccine manufacturing. So lots of industrial activity happens in the city. Now, when the second wave, uh, I mean, obviously the first wave had taken everyone by surprise, but we were better prepared when the second wave came. And uh, as I mentioned, I look after the information technology subject. So we had started uh, relying on a predictive analytical tool. We had asked some software companies to design this tool to help us map the spread of uh, this infections, fatalities, and to see in which direction, in what, at what speed, at what rate infections are spreading. So when the second wave uh, uh, started, we recognized that the industrial areas by and large are not going to witness too much of a chaos, too much of a havoc. And therefore, while there was lockdown for a shorter period in the neighborhoods, etc., we allowed the manufacturing sector to remain open. No restrictions were imposed. And that gave huge amount of uh, positive goodwill for the government. The manufacturing sector, which supports thousands of livelihoods, and contributes uh, to the dynamism and vibrancy of the economy. They were very grateful to us that we used uh, data, we used uh, objective uh, criteria to decide about the way infection is panning out. And we took a very bold decision, which went literally against yeah. the grain of the day. And uh, we were able to keep their confidence alive. And today, that has made Hyderabad a very attractive investment decision. Now that COVID is literally behind us and people are looking at new investments, etc. The fact that government is behind the industry is has given us a very, very strong uh, sense of goodwill and positive reputation in the market. So these Thank are two right. examples we wanted to cite to show what uh, can happen if you lose trust, but how quickly you can rebuild it again as well. That's a fantastic ex I mean, example. I think we started with the communications uh, being important and you used the word to say that the dialogue helped us to rebuild the trust. And then, then, then I think the decision making and consequences of our decisions matters. Uh, that needs to be in improved by the dialogue. We started from the very far west and now we are in the east and now we're going to go far forward, uh, to Phil Rowley, director of Iron Duke Partners of New Zealand. So we are just in three hubs in about 15 minutes, uh, looking at it from uh, all perspectives. Phil, the <laughs> floor is yours. Well, thanks, Medan. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, and like you, I'm looking forward to uh, meeting everybody face-to-face -face whenever we can do that uh, in Asia or wherever else we are in the world. Uh, as you've just said, I'm, I'm, I'm here today from Wellington, New Zealand. It's a lovely Friday uh, evening here uh, in Wellington, and I'll, uh, I'll look forward to having my cocktail party uh, soon after this is finished. <laughs> matter of fact, um, uh, just in terms of my own CV, uh, Iron Duke is a small... Uh, uh, consultancy business. We're operating in public affairs and public policy matters, uh, the interface of business and government in New Zealand and around the world uh, for our clients. But uh, previous to that, I was chief executive of Business New Zealand, the big uh, business lobby group uh, here in New Zealand. And uh, I was chair of uh, business at the OECD, the, uh, the business group that points towards the OECD based in Paris. I've been on the governing body of the International Labour Organization based in Geneva, pointing obviously at uh, the UN system uh, I've been a member of the APEC Business Advisory Council, advising APEC uh, governments until quite recently, uh, and I still do a lot of work in the B20 and G20 space, representing business there. And as soon as I start to travel again, which hopefully will happen sometime in the next two or three months, we'll be able to get back and do a bit more of that kind of work. Uh, so what I thought I would do is actually talk a little bit about the New Zealand experience, because uh, a lot of people celebrated what New Zealand was doing at the start of the pandemic, and we were if you like, some of the heroes of what was going on. We had we had and have very low deaths, uh, I think much less than 100 deaths out of a population of uh, 5 million. Uh, so people, people hold up New Zealand as an example of how to do it. And I've got a slightly more nuanced view than that, actually. Uh, we were good at some things, but not so good at others. So I thought it might be valuable for me just to talk a little bit about that. Um, so this loss of trust, for a start, was not a global, was not a uniform phenomenon around the world. In fact, New Zealanders' trust in government 
rose stratospherically at the start of the pandemic and only now is starting to fall away again for reasons I'll explain. Also, trust in business rose during the pandemic, at least in New Zealand and in many places around the world too. And the reason for that, I think, was that business was seen as a trusted advisor to their staff. The staff could talk to the boss and find out what was going on, and the boss was seen as, as helping the staff stay safe. So that was the case in New Zealand. And we had the interesting phenomenon of essential businesses. Many economies had that. But all of a sudden, people could understand that businesses were as essential as government agencies occasionally in terms of lives and livelihoods. And that was a very helpful thing in terms of building trust. So the New Zealand story was much about building trust at the start. And, and so why was that? If you look at why there was high trust and ongoing trust in government for the first year or so, uh, as we went into our lockdowns and so on, some of the hardest lockdowns in the world New Zealand went into, uh, there, there's still a lot of trust. Why was that? One, it's because New Zealand is the least corrupt country on earth. In other words, there's a, 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 a large trust in institutions. If our politicians say something to us, we will generally believe that to be true or near enough true. If our government officials say something to us, we will believe that's true, largely. And so that there was a, high, a lack of corruption and a high trust in institutions. And of course, those are things that you build over decades and you can easily lose. So it's just valuable for people to understand that. Second thing that happened to build trust was clear communication from our Prime Minister in particular and key public officials based not just on what they said, but based on widely accepted evidence. In other words, they used public policy as a tool and they used science as a tool to explain what was going on to the public. And so the public could buy into this and understand why that was. There was also, of course, a good dose of fear that was handed out, but that was true of all governments, not just our own. All governments induced fear into their populations in order to get them to do the right thing. The so third thing that was clear about New Zealand was an overwhelming concern for people. So there, uh, some in the business community, including me, would have said we needed to think more about some of the economics here that were going on, some of the damage going to, on to our businesses and so on. But at the start of the pandemic, certainly, there was this overwhelming concern for public health for people, and that really resonated with our, with our culture in New Zealand. Next point that caused a lot of trust in government, in New Zealand at least, was a widely held view that we are all in this together. In other words, our relatively egalitarian nature, our relatively our, our view about ourselves as New Zealanders, not always actually true, but nevertheless a widely held view that we are relatively equal helped a lot because we all felt as though we were in it together. And the last thing I, helped, I think that helped us was we all recognised there was no alternative. We closed our borders, essentially. We're the most isolated developed economy on earth. We simply closed. New Zealand citizens, nobody could come back. It's, it's as simple as that. We became a lifeboat in the middle of the Pacific, and there was a widely held view that there was no alternative to do that. Whether that was whether there was an alternative or not doesn't matter. People took a view that there was no alternative. And to a point that Jayesh makes, and I make this point a bit too, we also could do it because we're wealthy as a nation. When the Prime Minister said you should go home and stay home, well, we had a home to go to, largely, and so we could actually act in that collective fashion. Now what's happening? What's happening now to our country? Well, actually, what we're finding rather unlike or rather the opposite of, of some of the things that have been said by my compatriots, what we're finding is the trust in government is now fading. Why is that? Well, it's because the messages are much more complicated now. We're still hard locked down. So my major city, Auckland, the major city of New Zealand, is still in hard lockdown today and will be in hard lockdown till December the 3rd. You cannot visit a shop or go to a restaurant in Auckland. Most, and, and by the way, Auckland is at 90% double vaccination, 90%, and they're still locked down, right? So that gives you some idea about how this lockdown strategy has worked for the government. But as you can see, that message is much more complicated now. It's not about public health now. It's about opening up. It's about the economy. It's about seeing other things. So the messages have become much more complicated. And the government in New Zealand has stumbled because the clarity of the narrative a year ago is no longer anywhere near as clear. And the government's rather lost that narrative because other things have moved on around them and they haven't kept up with the pace of public opinion. Another thing that's happened, and it happened in all of our economies, is, of course, fatigue. We're sick and tired of being locked down. We just want to get back to life. And so that's playing out in New Zealand too, and trust in government is, is leaking away a little bit. I must say, off a, off a high base, and there's still a lot of trust, but it is leaking away. And it turns out 
that the government wasn't always up front with us. It turns out because as the media has started to dig into some of the things the government said at the start of this whole thing, it turns out that maybe the government could have represented things a little bit better, could have made better decisions. And sometimes they were basically misleading. And that's now starting to come out. So what we're seeing in New Zealand is slightly different to what everybody else has seen. High trust at the start, now starting to leak away for all sorts of pretty uh, serious and sensible reasons. Still, though, still very, very high trust in government, even having said that. What are the lessons from a New Zealand perspective that you can all take on board out of this? Well, I've got five. One, trust is hard fought for and easily lost. Uh, And the the government built that trust at the start and has started to lose some of it because they didn't keep up with public opinion and the public mood. Second, we need to build our own trust. It's all very well, all of us in this room blaming the government. We need to build our own trust. In our case, as a business person and as a business representative, I talk to the business community and say, what are you doing about building trust with your employees and your people and the communities you serve? You can't just rely on government to build trust. It's about wider institutional frameworks in the country. Third, the role of the media and critics is essential. We had a little bit of a, a, little bit of a challenge around some of that. The media was too kind of supportive at the start, if you like. They could never criticize because everybody felt as though we needed to support the government. It turns out that more criticism and more debate was necessary in any healthy democracy because it means that people can make choices about trust rather than simply being told. And the fourth point I'd make is allied to that. This whole idea of cancel culture and one correct truth, one idea of what the truth is, just doesn't work in the long run. You still need to run back to the democratic ideals of saying we need to have a debate about whether this is the right thing to do. And that's now starting to play out because now the debate has turned rather more ugly for the New Zealand government. Last one I'll make and I'll stop is lack of corruption and trust in public institutions. We all say it. It is the most important thing for the success of democracies and the success of countries. We, we forget about it at our peril. And it's at times like this that it becomes so important. So for all of you grappling with the relevance of those things, I say to you, the New Zealand experience shows that a lack of corruption and a trust in public institutions is that just the absolute core to getting through tough times, even if trust in institutions wanes over time because of some of the bumps in the, in the road on our COVID response. I'll stop there, Mr. Kevin. Thank you very much, um, uh, Phil. And I think the transition of gaining trust and then losing trust and then focusing on re-evaluating, so it's an ongoing process. We have the uh, pleasure to see Nasir. Welcome, I'm sure. It's great to see you. Um, I think we'll just progress uh, with your uh, comments. So Nasir Manji, Chairman, Development of Credit Bank India. Floor is yours and welcome. Thank you so much. And again, apologies. I couldn't get through the link to the wrong email address. Well, um, good to again, see you. welcome. Uh, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, you know, um, I want to open with just one sentence. Trust takes years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. So I think um, I would like to just use my comments to generalize the the issue of trust a bit going beyond COVID. Um, uh, The COVID responses we've heard uh, of New Zealand, of India, uh, um, et cetera. Um, I live in Dubai at the moment. And in a sense, Dubai has just done a phenomenal job with COVID. Um, Huge trust in government. The government responses has been absolutely brilliant. And I've lived through it. We've had just one lockdown, which was last year, but ever since their their medical uh, reaction, uh, the fact that every single person in Dubai was taken care of, every labor, workers, everybody. Um, And today we're in a situation where we have 66 cases in the whole of the UAE uh, and it is uh, flourishing. uh, but mask wearing is essential, even today. Um, while in the UK, um, you know, they've they've just abandoned all masks, all uh, 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 all uh, 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 protocols, and you have forty, fifty thousand cases a day in the UK. Um, so, in a sense, a lot of countries have responded in very different ways. Um, 
but I think the 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 UAE example is probably one of the best I have seen uh, that has combined a medical care control of the uh, of the uh, of the of the pandemic as well as the economic uh, issues uh, that has is is thriving today. But I wanted to just go beyond this a little uh, to talk about trust as a bigger issue in global governance. And trust is becoming a scarce uh, commodity at the moment. Trust in national institutions, trust amongst countries, trust in global governance, in, in intentions and mechanisms. People are losing faith in politicians, in the mechanisms of liberal democracy, and in indeed the very principles of fairness and equity. The rise of populism, I think, is a symptom of the loss of trust in the conventional forms of governance. People are desperately searching for alternatives. Reveal preference, which is an economic concept, uh, uh, is a powerful indicator of what choices have already been made and whether these are in the interests of welfare of society. Here are some examples. The reluctance of the first world to share vaccines with the developing world. I cannot understand this hoarding of vaccines in a time of pandemic where uh, Africa and a lot of South Asia require these vaccines. Why are we hoarding them? They will even expire. But we have no consensus of actually distributing these vaccines. I mean, that's a mind, mind, mind boggling uh, 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 concept. The inability, let's say, of the World Food Program today the, mig the migrant issue and the starvation issue of migrants and Afghanistan is, is horrendous. Six billion dollars are required by the World Food Program to, to actually immediately to help address some of these issues. And it's so difficult to raise six billion dollars. There is a real, there's a real uh, uh, fundamental problem uh, uh, in world governance. The recent COP26 demonstrated clearly the reluctance of nations to come to grips with an existential threat to the planet. Uh, and you see the gulf between uh, the nation states and the millennials and the, the young who really look at this uncertain future, the furor of the young uh, in terms of how nation states are actually dealing with the issue. And yet we have huge inequalities. You know, the uh, number of billionaires last year went up by 660. There are 2,700 um, billionaires uh, at the moment. Uh, and uh, 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 they have more wealth than 4.6 billion people who make up 6% of the world's population. Now, you know, what is going on in terms of this? And how do you generate trust when... All of this is happening in the, in, 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 in the global scene. And I think in the new, uh, this new century, the 21st century, the world has failed to produce a model of global governance that can tame power politics, let alone forge a sense of shared destins, destiny amongst nations. Do you know, I was just looking at the UN, the UN's annual budget. The UN's annual budget is $3.2 billion. New York City's annual budget is $100 billion. Surely we need a strong UN today for global governance, given all the global issues that the, the planet is facing. How, how, how are, we, are we really uh, pushing the idea of global governance and uh, putting, putting a little bit of weight behind it? So I think these are some of the issues, I think the broader issues that, that sort of, um, uh, that, that implicate us in terms of how much trust we can have in global leaders, national leaders, and in terms of the even regional leaders. The EU, for example, doesn't have consensus amongst itself, let alone how are we going to get consensus on the global stage. So let me conclude. Um, where do we... Where do we go from here? I think the first place to start is to care. The trust, 
trust deficit can be bridged even slightly if we have global leadership that cares for the planet and its inhabitants where economics and geopolitics are harmonized with a caring predisposition for the earth and its peoples where the refrain if i say who cares can be answered with some modicum of realism if i say who cares today for all the problems that i've talked about and there are many more it's very difficult to answer that question so let me conclude um i loved uh, my um, quotation from seneca in the 4th century uh when he said if you do not know to which port you are sailing no wind is favorable i'm afraid i don't think we have a clue as to which port we are sailing at the moment thank you very much sir this is like <clears throat> we just went around the how do we build and i i love the way you said the trust that you can build and then you can lose and it takes forever to uh takes seconds to lose and forever to rebuild and i think uh that will lead me to we have about eight minutes left in principle this could go for another two hours easily just to get the each one of you to ask questions but uh, i'll leave that a little bit to the end and then based on this in our own individual journey to develop ourselves to become who we are and to to learn to who are we to whom we have our own experiences that as local global family acquaintances friends colleagues we evolve through the life and i just want to know in each one of your uh, journey what was the meaning of the mentorship who have you been to a mentor who has been a mentor to you that meant maybe in relation to building your trust to yourself and to the others so please let's just go very quickly and mention about that mentorship and considering the time also love it to know what book has touched you uh, or received uh, that it touched you or you gave somebody and changed their life and that may be this broader sense of development tell skills to become better leaders will help the audience as well to bring their own experiences and reflect i believe reflection brings realization may bring transformation and resonance if we have the right tools in our toolbox so consider that we are putting more tools in our toolbox uh, manfred can we just carry on uh, with yourself thank you thank you for all your in, uh, your input here this was very interesting uh, from from my from my side let me just say quickly here for, professionally speaking at the university level uh, from my past experiences i must say that i have learned today things how how not to do things in terms of mentorship okay so uh i have been i have i had supervisors who were authoritarian so a boss is an accomplished uh ready person who has an accomplished employee from whom the boss expects products the mentor is an, an not an accomplished person is 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 a person in development who is helping another person in development to get, to to develop yeah. this is mentorship So what I learned is how not to do things as I try to with my staff to be a mentor to my staff to have my my colleagues to to learn with me everything in my in the portfolio so that they can be you know taken over when tomorrow I can't right yeah. that 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 for me is important for the books um mm-hmm. uh, my 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 late father I inherited his uh, library when I was 21 he died when he was 48 here's an old book from K O Schmidt 1935 uh neue lebensschule the new school of life that is um one uh, each week a lesson for one year to become a different person uh th- there it says the 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 french version was launched by astra in paris guess what in paris i found the french version here nouvelle art de vivre uh, you can still find it in the in the um, in the amazon interesting thing it's not a cheap positive thinking stuff but it's from the 30s very good author about uh, development uh, l'hygiène physique intellectuelle et spirituelle <laughs> so there we go uh, thank you very you. much thank you it'll go a long way i think it'll go a long way for everybody jayesh over to you please thank you and uh, it was very fascinating to listen to other panelists so uh, more than uh, a personal mentor for me i would like to speak very briefly about a national phenomena which i mean is uh, in some ways very puzzling but in some other ways it is also very intuitive and makes lots of sense so 
Mr. Monji will perhaps uh, know this, but not others. So during these uh, last uh, 18 months uh, of uh, extreme distress in the country, one national figure has uh, risen very prominently. He is a uh, film personality, but again, not someone who is extremely popular. But right from the early days of this pandemic, his name is uh, Sonu Sood. He has uh, shown tremendous amount of empathy for people. His uh, Twitter handle today is the most uh, sought after handle for any kind of person who wants to seek uh, relief or help. In fact, he was the first person who introduced, uh, who, uh, who kind of seeded the idea that instead of allowing migrant workers to walk for miles to reach their destinations, why can't we charter an aircraft and send them or uh, hire a train and send them? And subsequently, it appeared so uh, easy to implement idea that uh, national governments and state governments did that. So, uh, and uh, this is also related to this point of trust that if you lose it, there will always be someone else who can very easily occupy that mind space. So, while it takes a long time to build it, very easy to lose. And uh, very soon you will realize that you are no more the flavor of the day. Someone else has replaced you. So that is the lesson from, uh, I guess, Sonu Sood's message. And uh, not so much of a book, but I'd like to, I, I watched lots of movies in this lockdown period. And uh, I would like to speak about an Indian movie, which has impressed me quite a lot. It is uh, incidentally of a very recent origin, made in a regional language in India called uh, Tamil. Uh, this movie is called Jai Bhim. And again, uh, shows a character which is very similar to Sonu Suits. This is a lawyer who defends, uh, again, uh, the most vulnerable people who were falsely implicated of a crime. Every odd was stacked against them. But how this particular lawyer never lost faith, kind of stood behind them and got them a judicial uh, victory. That is the theme of that movie. So shows that how uh, one can be on the sides of the vulnerable and the underprivileged and really uh, win the battle. Guys, thank you very much. That's very uh, insightful uh, life journeys. Uh, Phil, over to you, please, and then we'll go to Nancy. Just a few thoughts on uh, a few thoughts on mentorship. Uh, I was um, lucky. I have been lucky all my life to uh, have mentors, both men and women, largely in my early time, men, uh, because that was the nature of the thing. You know, when I was a kid, uh, and since that time, women. Uh, and one of the one of the insights I've got about that in terms of building trust is that mentorship is an ongoing thing. A lot of people think it only happens when you're young, <laughs> you're starting your career. I still have mentors today, uh, and you know I'm hardly in my first flush of youth, uh, Mr. Chairman. So you know I still have them and I actively seek them out. They they play out different different roles. So some are more formal than others. Uh, some are simply advisors of one sort or another. But I always think about them as mentors, and they help me through largely life's life's uh, uh, decision points. The, 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 you know, when you come up to a giveaway sign on the road, you're going to turn right or turn left. They really help in those sorts of circumstances. And in terms of how I might give back now, one insight I'd give you is that I really try and help people who are otherwise without them. Uh, so people who approach me to, for help, uh, I will generally help them. And what I find is interesting is that young men and in particular young women will approach me because they're not used to having mentors that they can trust. They, they're not familiar with that. So I'd certainly encourage everybody to think about how you can reach out to non-traditional audiences, not traditional people, and offer them some advice, either advice over a day or over an hour or over a, over a period of time. So that's, that's a thought for you about mentorship. Just in terms of books, I've got two for you. These are two books I give away all the time to people. I, I've, you know, I've almost got a stack of them in the bookcase ready to give away. The first is Don Quixote. Both are classics, by the way. Don Quixote, Miguel Cervantes. A great book when you read it over and over again of dignity, of faith, of commitment. People think of Don Quixote as a strange sort of character, but when you read through him, he is about faith and dignity and, and old-fashioned commitment. I love that because that's the sort of person I think I might be as well. The other one I give, I'll give you is The Little Prince, a wonderful children's book, but actually a wonderful book about love and loss and, and accepting both of those things. And, and I, those are great human things and I've always taken a view that business is not just about not even mainly about balance sheets and uh, P&Ls and all the rest it's actually mainly about human behaviour and I, that's why I love those sorts of books thanks for your time Mr Chairman Thank you so much Nasser, floor is yours uh, Thank you uh, as far as mentors concerned when I got back to India from the London School of Economics um, I didn't know what I was doing I was uh, uh, writing articles for newspapers and then I came across 
Mr. H. T. Parekh, who was the chairman of ICICI, it's a development bank, and I just happened to meet him, and he said, "What are you doing?" So I said, um, "I'm, you know, I'm looking for something." And he said, "Look, why don't you join me to set up uh, a housing finance institution in India?" Um, and uh, I was the first employee of HDFC, which is today a hundred billion dollar group. <laughs> and he started from nothing, uh, so Thank it's you. amazing. Uh, so he was always my mentor. Um, amazing character, amazing human being. Uh, I've never, never. He still lives with me. I think uh, I, 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 I adored him. Uh, the other. Uh, and I've done a bit of mentoring myself um, with uh, young uh, uh, young people through the business, uh, through the Bombay Chamber of Commerce. They shadow me, for example. They shadow me around, um, and I love the pro- I love the experience, and you know, I, I I enjoyed doing it. And in a sense, I learned a lot from uh, from them as well. Um, so it was a two way uh, two way. It trip. is certainly a mutual. Yes. Yeah. And the other uh, book, just one book, because we have very little time. Finished. <laughs> um, the book that I have been influenced a lot by, and I've helped to influence a lot, is Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think it's a, an amazing book uh, that is applicable not only to human family life but to organizational life. So this is the book that that has been very much my anchor. But the book that I'm reading now is a fascinating book called The Web of Meaning by Jeremy Lent. Uh, it's integrating science and traditional wisdom uh, to find our place in the universe. And it's amazing. He's taking science and showing that the mind-body problem uh, and, and discussing that uh, in, in uh, truly effective ways. Um, so I recommend that. In few minutes, we had such amazing uh, knowledge power that can be utilized. If we just read these books and understood the meaning of the mentorship from each hour's experience, that's a classroom right there that can just grow from there. In my journey, I believe that we evolve in life from our evolution to this moment. We create our patterns, define them, and towards our shared legacy. And in this journey, I realized my philosophy of being that I am, we are, consciously empowered to empower in our being, living, giving, grow to our full potential, both individually and collectively, by integrating philosophical, entrepreneurial, philanthropic values, and certainly as mentor to mentor, peer to peer. Deal to deal, reach, let's reach out to many with purpose that is really adding value. The examples that you have given each one of you from different hubs of the world, from different economical cycles, different cultures, different religions, brought us together to talk about how we can add value. And I think with that spirit of the the trusted, caring, heartfelt resonation, please let's reach out to many. Be well, be safe, and look forward to seeing you in the Horasis. Hopefully, a physical meeting as soon as possible. I really thank you. I'm sorry that we didn't have uh, John Blakey joining us. I'm sure it must be a technical issue. He reached out. John, thank you. We felt you. Your, your spirit was here. And uh, have a great day and enjoy the rest of the sessions. Um, really, really pleased to meet you. Thank you. And I'll just stop the video, but we can carry on if you like. Uh, I'll just stop this. Uh, have a fantastic day, audience! Thank you for joining us. Your patience listening to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. We will be in touch.